Good morning, metalheads of the internet. Welcome to a new episode of the Metal Meltdown. Today, we've got a special guest. We've got Rick Giordano from The Lion's Daughter. He's going to tell us all about their brand new album, Skin Snow, coming out in April, and all the fun, weird, and fucking fucked up stuff they've been up to. Enjoy! <laughs> Hello, hello? Yes. Hello. Oh yeah, got gotcha. you. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm better now. Here, <laughs> how is uh how's this mic on your end? Is it is it is it hot or is it all right? Oh no, it's all perfect on my end. Cool. For for okay. some reason you couldn't hear me, but I could actually hear you clear as day. Okay. Yeah, well I've got um I've got uh like my my little home studio set up in my office. Um, so I was just going to try to run the mic through, um, you know, f so, so you'd get better audio from me versus, you know, the, whatever, whatever my, uh, laptop here would pick up, but just, I, I don't know. I never know how this shit works. Every time I open this, this, uh, this thing, it's a uh, trial and error, but I think we got it. If, if it makes you feel better, I am the most not tech savvy person on the goddamn planet. Okay, perfect. <laughs> like, like I, my my setup is quite literally a microphone, and I've got my phone up on a stick. It's it's weird because my my laptop is yeah. garbage. I think I'm being generous by saying my laptop is garbage. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've got. I mean, mine is an HP. I guess that's a decent brand, but um, I, it works enough. It works well enough. So, uh, aside from fumbling with tech, what have you been up to? How are you? Thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, been all right. Um, had a, a, my my basement backed up and uh, flooded today, and had sewer people out and dealing with that stuff. And you know, uh, the, the the kind of fun adventures that you have when you're stuck at home. Absolutely. Uh, but, I by sheer yeah, coincidence right. had a had a pipe burst maybe about a week and a half ago, so I know the feel exactly. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, there are a lot of other things I would rather spend three hundred dollars on, but uh, you know uh, that's part of being a homeowner, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's where I'm lucky. I've got I've got like a very lonely basement apartment. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I did that up until just a little over a year ago, and um, the very first thing I did well, once I bought my my own home, my first home, uh, I had it exactly four days, and then I set it on fire <laughs> and lived in a hotel for five months after that. So, uh, you know, buying a house isn't all it's cracked up to be, but uh, I'm glad that I have one now, you know, since this whole pandemic and quarantine and everything else. It's it's pretty great to, you know, if you're an antisocial person like I am, it's pretty great to have your own uh, your own space and nobody above or below or really next to you either, you know. Do, do you record a lot of your own music from home right now? Uh, yeah, well... So like the the records that w like we put out, um, like the new record coming out, we recorded that um, at a at a studio. You know, Sanford Parker came down from Chicago to um, to record it and stuff. But uh, I write and demo everything at at home. You know, with you know fake drums and and stuff like that. So fairly you know low quality, but uh, good enough for demo stuff where you can you can hear everything clearly. Okay, cool. I guess that's a great segue into my my first question. What was it like writing and recording an album in quarantine? Uh, it was different, but I, I enjoyed it. Um, also, my dog is just gonna always up my ass every time I do this. She thinks since no one else is in the room, she thinks I'm I'm talking to her. Um, <laughs> but, um, sorry. Back to the question. Uh, uh, it was. Interesting. Actually, it was it was kind of great because it gave me something to do, like something to focus on. Um, because my my line of work is in you know the the live music industry, which obviously is is not really existent right now. Mm -hmm. um, like we shut down. Our last show uh, was in was or, or at the sorry at the venue that that I, the, I work at uh, was March thirteenth. So uh, I you know quickly had nothing to do and uh, you can only drink so much beer and barbecue you know for so many weeks straight before 
you kind of start to go a little crazy. Um, so it was really cool to have something to focus on uh, and get excited about and kind of, you know, dive into like writing an album. So, um, yeah, it was, it was cool. Uh, it was just a different experience because we didn't really get together and, you know, in a, we didn't get together in a, in a room and play all of this stuff live and work it out that way because it wasn't, you know, not the best idea to get together with some other people in a small room mm-hmm. uh, right now. Uh, so really the first time that we played a lot of this stuff, you know, live or, or, or ever heard it with real drums was in the studio. So it was a different way to approach it for sure. But, uh, but I liked it. I think we ended up with a slightly different result as well from having to do it that way. But, uh, yeah, man, I've also just had about, uh, uh, an entire pot of coffee. If I'm kind of all over the place, that is why, <laughs> but hopefully that answered your question. I'm, I'm all over the place myself. Don't worry. That's, that's part of the Perfect. joy of, uh, being an autistic metalhead is I don't know how to stop, how to sit down, how to do anything. Perfect. So we're, neither of us are tech, uh, tech scabby and, uh, tech scabby. Apparently one of us can't even speak and that would be me. <laughs> uh, neither of us are tech savvy, uh, and we're both scatterbrained. So this is, this is going to go great. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is going to be wonderful. I can already tell. <laughs> <laughs> right. Did, did writing and recording the album in quarantine, did that change what the album was about at all? Or is this just li- more Lion's Daughter doing what Lion's Daughter does? That's a good question, and I'm not totally sure. Um, it's always weird. I have to look back at the records once they're done to figure out what the hell they're even about half the time. Um, but I think a lot of the th- a lot of the themes that are in there, yeah, could relate to uh, what was happening at the at the time, you know, or is still happening. But uh, uh, yeah, there's because there's a lot of stuff about um, about isolation and fear and dread and uncertainty uh a bit of of of, i don't know desperation and sadness and you know um all these things i think we all kind of were were feeling especially in that that first chunk of uh you know the whole quarantine Mm -hmm. and, and everything um i think it's a it's a colder sounding record in general um and yeah, I think I think it did have an effect. I think I could if I if I tried to 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 listen and, and detect uh you know, if if whether or not the quarantine had had an effect, I think I, I would definitely be able to hear it because it's not quite as I don't think it's as like violent of a record as like the last couple have have be. It's a it's a little um I don't know, there's kind of a, a more of a solid foundation to it um I, th- I think you know because kind of a result of you know just being in your house every day like like i was and am um you know versus being out in the in the world and and interacting with with different things so um yeah yeah because something i i notice about uh the last couple of months or so with like a lot of rock hardcore metal extreme music a lot of it is dealing with uh, isolation and loneliness and depression, and it, it's been kind of fascinating to see music being directly or indirectly impacted by COVID-19 and quarantine. Yeah, um, yeah, I would never intentionally make a record that, you know, that was related to, to the quarantine just because, I mean, you know, it would be quickly dated well hopefully it'll be quickly dated anyway assuming we get out of this shit um but uh yeah it also just seems like it would be too obvious of a of a, of a thing to do maybe a bit of a um, cop-out if just you were, like you know, oh cool a quarantine thing yeah yeah it'd just be i don't know it'd be like i'm sure there are bands that did it but any band you know after like september 11th that you know put out a record that was about the twin towers or something you'd be like dude fuck off with this record you know uh I, so i i think it, it could be similar to this you know if if uh let's say a band you know, top of my head like pig destroyer put out like a new ep that was all about the quarantine you're like fuck, come on i've had enough quarantine man i don't really want to <laughs> listen to anything else about the fucking quarantine that's um, that's a good point i don't think but, we need more reminders of this 
Right, right. That's why, like, the setting for for our record, if it has a setting, is definitely a different place in time than than right now. Or, you know, what what I had in my mind's eye as far as where this record took place was decades ago in a in a completely different world, a different place. Mm. Um, I've actually I've got a press release here that actually says specifically that Skin Show is the soundtrack to Times Square in the 1970s, the epicenter of sin and salacious misdeeds. Right. Um, now, does that one say is, or does it say could be? I asked them to change it, because I hated how definitive the phrase <laughs> saying, saying it is. The, the um, one I, I have... I thought saying... I, I, shit, I lost the thing for a second here. Oh, it's okay. Me well, being, I'll just... Me I'll, if it does say that, let me just correct it now. Uh, I would like for it to say that it could be, or or, or it's, it's, it's as if... Um, because it's not like it's just a record about Times Square in the 1970s or something. But uh, that was kind of a location that I kept in mind uh, when when writing, just kind of in general, just the general vibe of that place. You know, I wasn't there, so I, I don't know for sure. But what I know about it and things I've seen, like you know, like from you know from old movies or or uh, um, I kept the movie Maniac in mind a lot. You know, um, like the the original. Uh, William Lustig one, okay. uh, you know, just, just the, the, you know, the, 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 just how sleazy that character is and the, and you know, the, the prostitution and the underbelly of this whole era area and then kind of, you know, his own mania with, you know, speaking to these mannequins and the abuse that you see that he's suffered and these different things that, that was just kind of, um, you know, it, it that was a, a, a setting to just, kind of put my brain in while writing stuff because it kind of helps me to visualize uh something um in order to to kind of land on a certain sound uh and then especially like with lyrics or something i've, I've got to just you know kind of picture a world that that i'm then you know uh, uh talking about or i'm putting myself in the shoes of one of the characters in that world or or whatever so um so it isn't like it's um you know, of, of, of concept record about Times Square in the seventies or something. But, um, you know, you could relate it to something like that. If you if kind of, if you kind of think of that time in that era and what you know about it, uh, th- those themes could, could easily relate to this record. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. You just answered a, a question I was about to ask. Is this a concept album? <laughs> right. That's part of the beauty of, of coffee rambling. I just answer the questions that haven't even come yet. <laughs> you're you're reading my mind. That's what's going on. Right, <laughs> right. How does how does uh, neon so no, yeah. how does neon teeth play into uh, skin show? Because this this was a weird song for me. I, I the the main synth, that main keyboard riff in the opening, it reminded me more of The Exorcist than New York. To be entirely honest. Sure. Yeah. Um, still, you know, seventies. Um, Touche. So that that kind of vibe is still there, but um, yeah, I don't. You know, I saw several comments that you know said um, said things about The Exorcist, and you know, some were kinder than than others. I think I saw a couple of those like, "This is someone just screaming metal lyrics over The Exorcist theme." Like, I don't, I don't think the song's nearly as good as The Exorcist theme, but thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I would take that as a compliment, personally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I assume that person pre-ordered the record immediately. <laughs> um, uh, well, sorry. What was the 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 full question, though? Oh uh, no, I was I was just asking uh, Neon Teeth. Where does where does that fit into the the album thematically? Uh, it's kind of hard to say because I'm not even totally sure. Um, you know, part of the fun about creating a, an album or any piece of art is leaving things up to interpretation, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes. I mean, honestly, I have to look back after it's done and then figure out what it meant. Um, Because if I, if I, if I, if anything's too premeditated, it comes out uh, contrived. And uh, honestly, I just, I can't look at it or live with it at at all because I feel like it was, it was forced and uh, like I faked something. So it's easier to just create whatever the thing is and then afterwards go like, okay, what the, what the hell is all of this? What does this mean? Where does it come from? Um, Neon Teeth's one I'm not totally sure about. I know how how it how it feels to me, and I know how I feel how it relates to other feelings uh, within the album and themes on the album. But it's something that I 
really have a hard time defining. Um, you know, the 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 neon could, of course, relate to you know all of the the, the flashing signs and and stuff from somewhere like like Times Square. But then, you know, the teeth is is, is that thing that's you know. Uh, is, is kind of underneath it all, like the thing that's ready to, to bite or attack or, or prey on you or whatever. You know, it's these, these, um, see, I think I'm figuring it out. Maybe this is what it means. This is the first time I've tried to talk my way through figuring out what the hell it means. Um, that's actually yeah, kind of so what it, that's actually kind of what it sounds like to me is that like it, it's a very cold and malicious track and there's like something waiting in the, in the alleys or in the shadows, maybe ready to take revenge or, or ready to prey on something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the neon is the, the, the flashy attractive thing to lure you in to ultimately, you know, the teeth that, that are going to bite. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the song sort of works that way a little bit too, where there are kind of those clashing elements. There's like, there's like kind of, there's, you know, kind of a hooky little melody and there's kind of, you know, upbeat kind of like disco drums almost at times and it ultimately leads to this big kind of downer weird black metal ish ending that you know the song so the song starts pretty like bright and upbeat and i think ends in like complete devastation you know mm -hmm. so it's it's that 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 neon attractive thing to lure you in but then ultimately you know you you, you done got bit i uh, i showed a buddy of mine that track and and his uh he asked me, and I'm quoting him directly, "Who put nine inch nails in my black metal?" Like, like his added, like he was. Fuck yeah, I did it <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad he got it. I'm, gl I'm so glad that he got it. Yeah, because the 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 ending of that song, especially, dude, that's straight nine inch nails. That's uh, like a straight up. I think I think uh, closer does that, and you know mm -hmm. several other songs. So, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, bite. No pun intended. If you're gonna bite something from Nine Inch Nails, um, you know, rip off their their biggest song. Don't want to uh, yeah, bite see, the hand your friend, that feeds. Your friend gets it. <laughs> no, that I mean, that's even the vibe I get from that. That main hook even kind of sounds like something that could have been on one of the earlier records, like Pretty Hate Machine, but with a little bit more sinister edge. Totally, yeah, and I I love that stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it makes sense that 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 would come out. You know, I think even the the song in general, um, the way that the the drum beat uh, works, and and some of the some of the rhythm, you know, the rhythm stuff with the bass and everything, um, I think sound a bit like um, what is the what is the song called? The hand that feeds. That's from the album with teeth, and maybe that shit. Maybe that's where teeth came into mind, and all of that. Oh stuff yeah, relates, uh, but but when you bite the hand that feeds that whole bit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Great song. Yeah, that one's yeah, that's a a, a rad song. I think that one's a little more it kind of does the open and closed hi-hat thing with with the drums. So it's got a little bit more of like a disco vibe. But um yeah, man, I I love 9 Inch Nails. So I I think I've there was a band I very much kept in mind when writing this record so that's cool that both of you guys hear that stuff i i uh i mean i love nine inch nails i mean i think one of the first albums i ever bought come to think of it might have been the downward spiral and even when listening to future cult that was something that i thought of like this kind of feels like nine inch nails but with a very like harsh black metal spice yeah for sure um i just i, I just wish we had a singer that could sing like Trent Reznor and <laughs> and write songs like he does, but um, that's where we're lacking a little bit. Is in a uh, a little bit, we're lacking a lot in vocal ability, uh, which is pretty <laughs> limiting. So I think that's why we kind of go crazy on the with the music side and experimenting there so much. But um, yeah, I mean, all all of us are huge industrial music fans, um, and I, I pretty safe to say we listen to that stuff more than anything. Like if we're if we're on tour or whatever, it's like Skinny Puppy and Judas Priest pretty much nonstop. That's an um, awesome playlist. Yeah, it's really it's really all you need. I can just I can just picture that right now, just like, all right guys, we did it. We just played another show. We played our black industrial sludge alternative, whatever the hell that is. Now let's listen to Heading Out to the Highway. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, man, that that firepower record just got played nonstop. Uh, when that came out, we we were uh, on the tour on the West Coast for a couple of weeks and just yeah, just just on repeat, man. God, that that it'll, album it'll, is it'll, way it'll, better than it has any right to be. <laughs> it definitely is. Yeah, it, it is. It was a. I don't want to say it's a nice surprise because it was Judas Priest, but I, I didn't expect them to put out anything like that stellar again, and you know, this this far into their career. Oh no, I mean that that's on par with like screaming for vengeance or defenders of the faith as far as i'm concerned yeah it's 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 up there it could have used my my only my only one little wish was that it had a little more painkiller to it like that it was just a little faster they basically blow it they they blow the the, their wad in the first few tracks i think because all the fastest stuff is there so i think if it had just like a little more like of a thrash metal element to it it would be it would just be a perfect record to me but uh but uh, I'm, I'm definitely ha- happy to have it as is and and shit hopefully they've got they've got more in them you know so I there mean, might be another one coming soon yeah rob halford always talks about making a new judas priest record so who knows um and and he knows that the fans love painkiller because when they play live they still put in yeah. tons of painkiller songs so who knows maybe yes. one day we'll get that sound again yeah, yeah, yeah. They played um, uh, shit. We saw Scott, uh, our bass player Scott, and I saw Jews Priest three times in in twenty nineteen, I guess, uh, and then had, had had tickets for another one uh, that was supposed to be you know last September that of course got canceled. But uh, they played pretty similar sets the first couple times, and then that third show uh, they played All Guns Blazing from Painkiller, which was real cool. Real, real cool. I think I actually freaked out some of the people that were around us when he started singing those for first couple lines because I lost my fucking mind and was just, you know, was having as good of a time as you're supposed to have at a Jews Priest concert. But, uh, <laughs> and they were just like, what is this, a rock concert? <laughs> yeah, it's weird, man. I don't know. Have you have you seen them or anyone like that in recent years? Any of the, the, the older kind of legacy bands? Uh, sometimes, but I, I see them reacting more that way to opening bands. Like, I saw Judas Priest in 2017 when Mastodon opened for them, and oh, wow. the the crowd just was not digging Mastodon at all. They were just I, like, what yeah, is I this? Yeah, I see that. They were just like, this is like prog, but it's also really dark and heavy, and there's three vocalists, there's four vocalists, and he's drumming at the same... I don't get it at all. Why can't they just play some classic right. rock? Like, yeah. the Mastodon was getting well, no explains... love from that cloud crowd. Right. Uh, that explains why, I mean, the, the times that we saw them uh, last year, year before, whatever it is now, um, the, the first time, I think, was Saxon opening, which, cool, but I, I don't really care to see Saxon. Um... The next time they were actually opening for Deep Purple, and I was pretty excited to see Deep Purple, but man, Deep Purple were boring. They were phoning it in hard. Oh, really? Uh, and yeah, they were not. I was excited, and w- as soon as they started playing, I was like, "Oh, these guys do not give a shit." I mean, they're also they're also quite old, so that maybe their age was showing a little bit. But yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a great show. Um, That's always. And then really I think the last time. Last time they were here, I think Uriah Heap opened. Oh, or no. the time coming up, Uriah Heap was going to open or something. But they basically they always are touring with like kind of like old fogey bands, which is like fuck, dude. Take take Anthrax out, you know, like take <laughs> take that would you know, be cool. Take like yeah, take like metal bands out, you know. But I guess if 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 I didn't know that they ever did stuff with Mastodon, but yeah, I could see where the Judas Priest crowd uh, wouldn't be into it. Cause yeah, what I was, what I was going to say was, yeah, it's, it's weird that every time I've, I've seen them, like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll spend good money on getting like some good seats, you know, pretty close if it's a band that I love that much. Um, and it's just weird how, yeah, it's kind of depressing, man. Like, like there, there are, there are people that won't even, you know, in the, in the third row, there are people that will just stay seated even um, oh. like, it's just a, it's like a geriatric, bummer <laughs> yeah i feel i i will say uh there there have actually been a couple shows come to think of it i saw guns and roses 2015 on the big mega reunion tour that definitely won't happen again and then it happened two years later um right and then again when i saw metallica i think it was 
2018, and both times when those bands would launch into some of the lesser known cuts, that I, I would look around and some people were like, what the hell is this? This isn't Paradise City. This isn't Enter Sandman. Yeah. What is happening? Yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, I went with a friend um, that, yeah, that big Metallica arena tour. That I think I think it was 2018. Um, maybe maybe it hit here in 2017, but um, yeah, it was it was it was that vibe there. Luckily, the the one stranger that I had to sit next to was some younger dude in a Megadeth shirt, and we kind of nodded at each other. And Volbeat were playing as the opening band, and I turned to him and I was like, "This sucks," and he's like, "Yeah, this sucks." I'm like, All right, you're okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like Volbeat, you're, you're cool to sit next to. Volbeat's weird, man, because. I, I kind of want them to either be a straight up rockabilly band or a straight up metal band, but not both. I it it just it ain't working for me, not one bit. Yeah, like I yeah, saw I them. I can't get past the the vocals. Yeah, I, I saw them with uh, they opened for Slipknot when they came here a couple years ago, and Gojira and Behemoth were also on the bill. So it's like a lot of really intense shit all day. And then in comes Volby yeah. doing like Johnny Cash covers and pulling out spoons and shit. Yeah. It, it the there were a couple country so people, people probably that, loved it. Yeah, some people liked it, but I don't know. There were also a lot it of people like that were like, them. "Where the fuck is Slipknot? Where the fuck is Behemoth?" Yeah, for sure. Could see that. Is there any any chance uh, of Lion's Daughter playing for uh, Volbeat anytime soon? Then. <laughs> hey, you know what? If they yeah. Uh, delete this part edit that part out of the uh <laughs> the interview in case in case they ever ask us on on tour that means i'd have to fucking hear them every night i can take a walk when they're playing i could <laughs> go i could go sit in the go get a beer go get a bite to eat. With headphones <laughs> yeah to totally there there um, was a point when that same uh, show where i think my girlfriend just looked at me and went just like aren't there a bunch of food trucks outside let's go get a bite <laughs> Right, yeah. You know what, there was a time that I, um, the guy, I don't even know his name, I want to say his name's Rob or something, I could be wrong, but the dude that's the guitar player of that band that was also in Anthrax for a while. Yes. Um, I, it, for, for reasons that are too stupid to even go into, I did do a shot of whiskey with that guy one time, or actually I think it was Jägermeister, because of course it's Jägermeister mm -hmm. with a band like that, but uh, that guy was super cool. I gotta say, that guy was like really, really cool. Um, so maybe the guys in Volbeat are all like really cool dudes, um, but it's, it's the music's just fucking awful. <laughs> no, you're you're really sabotaging the chances of a Lion's Daughter Volbeat Arena tour now. It'd be it'd be fine. You know what? Actually, speaking of Behemoth, so the Lion's Daughter we opened for Behemoth and Lamb of God, and the oh, thing shit. that was that was funny that I don't think Lamb of God knows is that I also write for uh, the local like like arts and entertainment paper here, the riverfront times, which is, uh, it's like St. Louis is like LA weekly. Um, and I wrote the most scathing review of lamb of God in probably like 2014 or 15, maybe <laughs> that, uh, then kind of went viral. It was on Reddit. It was all this, like people, people of course, like hated me for bashing lamb of God. But my, my argument was basically that like, it's boring. I thought it was boring. Um, it just, it was just kind of like, nothing metal to, to me. It was just riffs for the sake of riffs. And I don't know. I just, I didn't, I wasn't into it. And I, um, uh, so I wrote this review that was like super, super, uh, not good about, uh, the band. And then, you know, a couple years later we get asked to open for them. I'm like, okay, I guess they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. Just nobody tell them. Yeah. Just nobody <laughs> mention the article that, that I wrote. And I like kind of all night was waiting for one of them to confront me about it or something. And luckily that, that, that never happened and we had a great show. So, you know what my takeaway is go ahead and just talk as much shit as you want. Cause, uh, cause you're going to get away with it. Right. I, I like to imagine that deep, deep down, at least one of them knew and they invited you on purpose just to be like, we'll show you asshole. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> That'd be great. Or if like we went out and we're like, we're the lion's daughter. What's up? Which is not something we would ever say. But, uh, <laughs> if you know, we went to start and they ran out and like pulled my pants down. <laughs> and then, like, like the power. Good like, evening, uh, Montreal, and just whoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'd probably become a fan of the band after that. I would have to respect them for that. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I've seen them a few times over the years, and they've always put on like a pretty decent show. But I've never quite understood the 
undying love for them. So I'm kind of with you there. Yeah, they're they are. I said I said this in the in the article, which I, which you know, if somebody's listening wants to look up, it's it's really easy to find. Um, but I mean, they're all great at what they do. Um, but what they do is they're kind of just not in my eyes. It's not doing anything to me. There's no emotional resonance at at all with it. And the reason I think metal or you know extreme music in general or just music in general, the the fun of music is like you have a, an emotional reaction to it. Um, but something just going just doing that for two hours, like there's man, there's nothing here other than just like pounding your chest and having another beer before you have to go back to work tomorrow or whatever the, the whatever the fucking vibe is there. I just uh, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't speak to me. I I feel that. I mean, part of what I always look for in music is I I could care less how heavy something is. I could care less how many riffs there are. I want to know what they're saying. I want to know what they're trying to say. Uh, I, I want to know about the... I don't know. I want to know about the emotion that's coming... That's going into the music and coming out of it. I want to see what this band has to For offer. Sure. I can get riffs anywhere, especially nowadays. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could just... You could probably just turn and pick up a guitar if you've got one and play some riffs, which is more fun than listening to them half the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, no one wants to hear riffs that I've made, I promise you. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I've been, that's the one failure of quarantine for me. I I really tried to relearn guitar, and my brain was just like, "Nope, you can't do it." Yeah, but. yeah. It was uh, that that uh, that house fire that I mentioned earlier before we kind of started. Um, the one kind of cool thing that came from that was, yeah, I lived in a a, a hotel for like four or five months, um, and there's there's. It's not as fun as it sounds, man. Like it's like a fucking prison. Um, and, but one of the things I decided to do, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, I didn't have really like any of my stuff there, but I was like, I'm gonna bring a guitar here, and I can sit and watch YouTube videos and just learn how to play a whole bunch of songs and riffs that I that I've never known that I, before that I was always like curious about. Um, so I was digging into stuff like, um, of course, a lot of like Judas Priest stuff and Van Halen and stuff, and that led me to. Um, to learning rat songs and I always just kind of not, I always liked rat, but I always just sort of dismissed them as like, Oh, it's like a glam rock thing. I mean, their guitar riffs are kind of insane. Like they're really, really good guitar players in that band. Oh yeah. Uh, and they do yeah. really interesting, innovative things. Um, and that totally carried over into the next lion's daughter record, like big time. That thing is whether you, 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 you detect it or not. That thing is covered in like rat riffs. Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> like a like a like a serious glam rock rat influence. Yeah, completely. Huh. Uh, I okay. don't know if you've had have you had a chance to hear the whole record yet. Uh, I have not. Okay, okay. Uh, it might make it'll make more sense once once you do, or or maybe it won't. I don't know. I don't really know how it, it comes through. But if you break down just the, the guitars on some of the records like yeah that's straight like rat and Dokken and you know maybe like jakey e. lee uh era ozzy stuff um yeah because those were it was all the, those were all chords that i'd never really played before or experimented with and it was like oh well, shit this is cool like let's see what we can do with this all right so now i have to know with this in mind what are the chances of a straight up glam metal album from lion's daughter pretty good <laughs> at this point <laughs> lion's daughter if will spearhead can... the next glam metal revival i would love it <laughs> i don't know what the next record is yet uh it, you know it'll it'll be different than this one because they they always you know they're they're always a little different from each other but maybe that's the thing i think we're too we're i think we're too too ugly and too old to pull it off but we could get some pretty boy singer i i think that would actually make it like even cooler if it was just like a group of regular dudes and then like some super thin 18 year old blonde kid like some vince neal looking punk and he's just like what's up yeah. who's ready to party and y'all are just like yeah i guess we're ready to party i don't know yeah yeah we <laughs> fine that'd be like um i saw a diamond head uh, a year or two ago and it was like a bunch of old guys and then some like american idol jack off singing basically singing Diamond Head karaoke uh, in, in the front. Ooh. Um, 
Yeah, it was. I, I actually, I left. I couldn't. I couldn't watch it all. I that, was like, "This is. That this sounds is just really hard to sad. watch." That sounds really sad, actually. It 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 was it was it borderline uh, embarrassing. I I thought, but I mean, I get it. You got to get somebody to sing, and this guy's doing the rock thing, and he's got the the fucking cool jacket on with the eagle stitched on the back. That's lame. It was just so lame. So. There, there was uh, like I don't a, even know what happened to that. There was Sorry. like a period for a while, too, where every 80s rock band had like a really young, hot singer. Because it was just like, yeah, we need someone to bring the people in. We need someone to bring the women in because they'll bring in their older husbands and stuff like that. Like, I remember Quiet Riot even had, uh, what's his name, James Durbin from American Idol for a bit. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He, he wow. was there. For, he did like two albums with them and everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the bands where the the opposite is true, like yeah, I guess it's it, it's. Uh, I don't know. I saw Grim Reaper, which is the opposite, and they were never a glam band, but, um, you know, it was the opposite where it was the singer and then a bunch of young guys, and that looked equally strange. Um, you know, or even uh, you know, Wasp, who are still doing stuff. It's like Blackie Lawless, Ooh. who looks Ugh. who looks like he's been dead in a river for three years. <laughs> Uh, and then like young LA dudes like backing up me like, all right, this is a little strange too. So I don't know what the answer is, but, um, he, you know, it's, I'd much rather see, uh, I'd rather see all the old dudes all looking bad, all playing their shit together, you know? Yeah. It, it, Cause at least then it'd be, it would make sense. At least then you wouldn't go, who are these cute young kids and who is this old man dressed like Alice Cooper? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, something I've wanted to know about the Lion's Daughter sound. Why synths? Why keyboards? Why this, like, new wave industrial influence? Because I'm down with it, mind you, don't get me wrong. But it seems like, uh, it seems like such a weird turn to take after the more straightforward black and sludge metal of your first two records. Uh, yeah, I could see how it could seem strange, uh, to some people. To me, it was super obvious, because I always heard that stuff in my head anyway. Um, and for the most part, if I'm going to throw on music, um, you know, uh, especially a few years ago when we started with the synthesizer stuff, um, I'm either gonna throw on like some, some, you know, I'm going to throw on rust in peace or something, or I'm going to throw on like carpenter brute. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, and the, uh, the it'll meet in the middle and I'm listening to, you know, ministry or, or, you know, nine inch nails or something like that. So to me, that was just, that was just kind of completing the vision that was just kind of piecing all of the worlds together as far as like what my tastes at that time were. Um, so the synthesizer seemed like, uh, like a really, really obvious thing to do actually. So I was, su I was surprised to, you know, see that the, that the people reacted uh, the, the way they did to see that people were, were surprised, you know, that, that, um, that we had done that. But uh, yeah, we even, uh, you know, on, on the first, the first album that we did with season of mist um, is existence is horror. Uh, there are synths on that record. You don't, they're not super obvious and they don't really carry like, you know, melodies or leads or anything for the most part, but they're, they're on that record. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really just a matter of figuring out how to logistically add synths. you know, um, I, w I would either have to find somebody that was, you know, a, a keyboard synth, whatever player, uh, that had the exact same musical taste that I did to join our band uh, and rely on them to, to write stuff and perform and, you know, all that stuff, or just figure out a way that we could just keep it the three of us and do it. Um, so once we were able to figure that part out, how to like, okay, well, how do we write it this way? How do we play along with it? How do we take it on the road and play it live like this? Like once we were able to figure that stuff out, it just kind of, you know, um, blew the doors wide open to kind of, uh, um, you know, integrate any kind of synths or other sounds in, in any way that we, we really wanted to. So, yeah, again, it just seemed like it seemed like the natural next step because we had done the thing where we kind of toned things down already. We're in, like, what, 2013 or something. We did a, uh, a collaboration with a folk band uh, called Indian Blanket, and we mm -hmm. did that to see, like, all right, what happens if we quiet things down and we have, like, acoustic guitars and all these different 
you know, uh, natural textures and clean vocals and, and things like that. It's like, well, we did that experiment already. So let's, uh, you know, go the other direction, make everything louder and add a bunch of, uh, synthetic sounds. And how would you respond to metalheads saying that, uh, that sound is too weird and that you should return to a more straightforward black or sludge metal sound? I'd say go fuck yourself. And (laughs) how about your band can do that? How about that? (laughs) Bravo. Or if you, if you only like, like our first records where it was sludgy or it was whatever, go listen to those or don't, I don't give a shit. Uh, I'm not here for you. (laughs) And I mean mean that in the most endearing way possible. I wish that more musicians would say shit like that, honestly, because it's really disappointing to see bands experimenting and maybe not succeeding, but I admire the experiment nonetheless, and I want to see them continue to evolve. And then the fans go, well, we don't like this period. Just do the old shit. And then they go back to the old shit. It's, It's really disappointing to me. Right, because the old shit, it never feels, I don't know, even even when it's done really, really well, it's not the same. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a good example, but like, uh, obviously, the early Slayer records are fucking like flawless, uh, and then they kind of turned into like a boogie metal band for a while. Um, they had to do that to survive, I guess, or pay for Kerry King's monster trucks or whatever the <laughs> fuck they were doing. Um <laughs> But, uh, you know, then with, with Christ Illusion, when Dave Lombardo came back and they're like, all right, it's Slayer again. It was like, all right, this is this fucking rips, but it feels like guys trying to – it doesn't feel that genuine anymore. It feels like guys just trying to be who they used to be yeah. and give the fans what they think the fans want. Um, that was and that's s- cool. Like, that's yeah. a good record. But, uh, it yeah, it does it, – it didn't feel like that's – it didn't feel like that's honestly like where their hearts and heads were. At. They were just doing it because they had to go like, okay, well, let's be Slayer again. All right, let's listen to our records from the 80s and just kind of try to write something like that. And it's sad because that's so, pretty much how they treated all their other records after that. Like, it just got more and more ultra Slayer, like World Painted Blood leading up to Repentless. Yeah. Yeah, which, man, I, you know, I know Hanneman was still alive for World Painted Blood even and like, Dude, I think, but I think that and Repentless are both are, are, are shit. I don't like them at all. Oh, they're they're um, terrible records. Terrible, okay, terrible. Yeah. Don't worry, you're not yeah, going to offend anyone couple... here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've had, I've had a couple friends try to convince. They, they were like also huge Slayer fans. Try to convince me that World Painted Blood was good, and it's like, eh, no. I can hear how like, you know, their argument was like, no, this riff it sounds like behind the Crooked Cross, and this riff it kind of sounds like necrophobic and like that's cool i just we'll just go listen to those songs then yeah (laughs) honestly like i always got the same vibe too from like uh death magnetic where i was just like okay it's metallica they're a thrash band again they're done with hard rock they're done with fucking alt metal or whatever the fuck saint anger was and now we're a full-on thrash band and i'm just like but you're not not really and it's pretty clear as day and it it sh- it should have been clear to everyone yeah. in retrospect that that was a fucking lie because like, you know, ten years later they made Lulu and S and M two and they were back to doing what Metallica yeah. do, which is fine. Yeah. But you uh, know, at the same time, it's like, come on, guys. Yeah, totally. Um, I thought you know, uh, uh, what was the newest one? Um, that's a stupid title. Oh, the hard hardwired to self destruct. Yes. Um, like that's not a bad record, but that to me 100 percent sounds like a company getting together and writing what they think a metallica record would sound like like it sounds there it's there i feel like there's no there's no truth to it like uh, it's it's sounds super super confined uh, i, or, I uh, would contrived. agree with like, that i remember liking the the title track itself i thought that was a, a, a actually a pretty good song uh, I remember yeah. liking Spit Out the Bone, but the rest of it, I was just kind of like, yes. the rest of it, I was just like, I feel like I'm inside like a fucking a boardroom meeting and they're discussing how to make a metal album or more specifically a metallic Completely. album. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Um, yeah. Like there are graphs and charts and stuff out and they're like, well, sad, but true had this kind of thing. So put that in there and yeah, completely. But th- I think that whole record is worth it for Spit Out the Bone. That song is a straight up fucking ripper oh, i think that's the best cool. thing since you know it's kind of funny because it's kind of like 
it's kind of like Dyer's Eve, which might be my favorite Metallica song. And in my mind, it's the last good Metallica song. Like everything, I fuck, I hate the Black Album so much. Oh damn! Um, so to me, the the end of Injustice for All, where it ends with Dyer's Eve, like okay, cool. That they they never wrote a good song again until Spit Out the Bone, which is kind of just like Dyer's Eve. It's, but, um, it's definitely just as intense as some of that, like, older thrash stuff. Yeah, it is. And it, it you know, the first time I heard it, I kind of thought the riff was a little corny, but then it, 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 it grew on me. And, like, now that's, like, that's that's stayed in the regular rotation since that album came out. Just that song, but, um, you know, that that song is definitely... Is, is definitely solid and I think I think you could throw that on an injustice for all or something and it would be you know be right at home mm-hmm I, I remember even when I saw Metallica live uh, they played like maybe three songs they, they played four songs from that album the title track yeah. Atlas rise now that we're dead and spit out the bone and there was like almost no reaction on the thir- first three songs but spit out the bone people were like fuck yeah let's do this. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you must have seen them on the tour after. So I know I think they started playing "Spit Out the Bone" live after um, after I'd seen them. So where where are you actually? Where are you located? I am from Toronto, Ontario. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. So we are uh, not very close to each other. I'm here <laughs> in St. Louis. That's a good two day drive out to you. If I if I ever tried to drive out to St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've never I've never stepped foot into uh, Canada. Like we've toured Europe a couple times and stuff, but never never have gone uh, to to Canada. We were actually supposed to on um, we had a tour booked with Goblin uh, that got canceled, and then it got rescheduled, and then canceled and rescheduled and canceled again. But uh, on that tour, uh, the dates that were actually uh, got to be announced uh i think the very first show was was toronto like maybe the club was like Le garrison or something like that does that sound like anything uh no i I, if that is somewhere in toronto then i'm not familiar with it that does sound french it might be montreal okay i I could also just be making up french sounding words (laughs) and, and not know what i'm talking about at all but uh I'm pretty sure the first date was was Toronto, if I remembered, and it was like, okay, cool, that's going to actually be like, just personally, like my first time even even crossing, you know, that border, but uh, wasn't wasn't meant to be. Maybe maybe next year or some other time, but. And uh, that that's I've actually got a note here. Funny coincidence on a Facebook post last year, the Lion's Daughter account said, "Remember when we thought we would tour this summer? That was cute." So I think I. <laughs> I think I know the answer because everyone is everyone is uh, canceling or rescheduling the already rescheduled tours and shows and festivals. So I think I know the answer, yeah. but I'll ask regardless. Are there any plans to tour in 2021? Not officially. Um, there, there may be something happening uh, like September. Um, and it... it may also not be happening on this continent so uh <laughs> i think yeah I, we'll, I think it's safe to say north america at the least is not doing a lot of concerts for a while yeah it it sucks man it's it sucks how up in the air everything still is because you know and it, again in addition to playing in a band myself i work in the live music industry mm-hmm. um so you know both both work and play are put on hold you know still it's been 10 months we're still on hold um so you know hopefully some stuff starts happening in the summer i don't know if like you know even as as people are getting vaccinated i i'm just hopeful that hey maybe in like june you know outdoor shows could be a thing or you know or or there there becomes a certain way to start to start doing this um because obviously i don't think there's you know it's not worth risking people's health and people's lives and, you know, people's family members lives uh, to, you know, get 300 assholes together in a place without masks on to, you know, see Buck Cherry or whoever the fuck. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> that's about all, you, that's about all you could get to see Buck Cherry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Um, 
But I feel like those are the band, like your your Buck Cherries and Jackals and stuff like. I feel like those are the bands that are still playing shows. They're somehow still playing some biker bar in the middle of nowhere where it's a bunch of fucking assholes getting together with no dis, you know, no regard of this virus, and then a bunch of people get sick. Yeah, um, there uh, there haven't really been any shows at all that I can speak of in Toronto, not that I know of, but I've noticed all throughout the states. Uh, Trap is still touring. Fozzie is still touring. I think Smash Mouth even did like a big biker rock rally in in North Dakota or something. Yeah, yeah. So the people that are probably fucking anti-maskers to begin with, yeah, like those are the bands that they're they're probably into. It's um, it's funny you know. because I remember Trapped was supposed to come up here to Toronto. Not that I care because I wasn't gonna go, but <laughs> sure. they were supposed to be up here. And for all their boasting about being better than all these bands, the best venue they could secure was, and I use this term literally, a fucking dump. Like, the shittiest possible bar in the entire city. And, like, yeah. this this place, it's, it's lucky if they can, they're lucky if they can get a Motley Crue cover band, let alone the real Motley Crue. That's how bad this place is. Right. And right. with Trapped was like, nope, we're going on tour, we're doing this. And then, like, the the premier of Ontario had to be like, no, you're not. The province is shut down. The country's shut down. The show is canceled. Goodbye. Yeah. 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 I mean, if, if, honestly, if like those people all wanted to get together and you know uh, get get each other sick and they all die off, hey, that's that's your business. But <laughs> Ooh, uh, the, there goes in, the in trapped the meantime, lines daughter tour. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> shit. Um, you know, in, in the in the meantime, while you guys are perpetuating this this fucking thing, and the rest of us can't play shows and can't open our businesses because this virus stays alive because yeah. of assholes like you. you I know? mean, I'm I'm in a similar boat. I'm I'm a I'm a chef in my personal life, like as a job. Um, yeah. And before the pandemic, before the quarantine, I worked actually for Jamie Oliver at his restaurant in Mississauga, Ontario. Oh, okay. And uh, now, here I am, almost an entire year later, and last year I worked at a shitty dive bar, because that was all that was open, and now here I yeah. am, I'm actually moving further into the city, because I have, I gotta get to work, and there's no work where I am right now. Do they have, uh, are all restaurants shut down? A lot of them are. Um, we've, yeah. we've been a lot more uh, hardcore about this. Um, restaurants were only open for dine-in service in the summer, and even that was, like, super limited. Uh, yeah. but there are a lot of places open for takeout, plus I've got a lot of contacts downtown, so, you know. So to all you fucking anti-maskers out there, you don't have to agree with it, but, you know, it's good business just to kind of agree with it, so please do that. Yeah, it's just fucking just decency. Yeah. Just showing other people the slightest bit of, of courtesy and respect. You know, that drives me nuts. Why see these fucking people with their masks off or, or the guy in the store with, you know, with his nose hanging out. I just want to fucking smash them. I, I find it so infuriating. And I, for some reason, I, I consider it a personal insult. <laughs> um, Same. It's just like, 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 really, you can't do this for everybody. I don't want to wear the, a fucking mask when I go to the store or wherever either, but I'm. I'm doing it. Even if I were vaccinated or immune or anything else, I would still do it, and I'm doing it for you. So if I chose to not do it, I am saying fuck you to everyone else. You know, that's, I think that's the that's the only way that I can I can see that is is a fuck you from those people. Absolutely. Uh, I've I've noticed in some of the promotional images and as well on the album artwork, uh, there's that that white mask with like the the zipper mouth thing. I, I gotta know, has Lion's Daughter ever considered making, like, actual face masks for quarantine, but with that? <laughs> uh, no. But, uh, the thing that's that's uh, funny is I have that actual mask I have here at my house now. Um, that was... So the one you're talking about was on the cover of, of Future Cult. Um, and I know on Skin Show there's kind of something that's similar, but it's, you know, it's, it's a... It's a different it's a different mask and a different character and everything um but yeah the one that was on the fu cover of future cult uh so that photo was done by uh a belgian uh duo that go by the name of uh Othmeister. um and that image was from you know it was it was several years old and i came across that image before even writing future cult and that image strangely strangely like 
inspired uh, the record. Uh, and then I reached out to them like, hey, you know, is it possible to license this to use it for an album cover? And they are super, super cool. And they let us use it. And, you know, the album was released and everything. And I asked them, you know, not that long ago, I was like, hey, so that mask that's from, you know, that 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 photograph, like, where did you guys like find that? Because I, I kind of want to I want to I want to get one of those like, you know, those are really cool. And they're like, they said they found it in a sex shop in somewhere in asia um <laughs> of course and they it did. was like a a weird like one of a kind thing um and then they're like tell you what what's your address and they fucking sent it to me uh as a gift that is, is fucking awesome. so insane yeah it's it's so so cool i mean to think that like you know three or four years ago i saw that image in an, in an art magazine and now like that mask is on my shelf next to me, you know, that's, it's, it's crazy how, how that worked out. But, um, yeah, one of the first, I think when the pandemic first hit, I actually took a video of myself putting it on, uh, in my house. And I think I posted on our Instagram or something like, all right, well, ready to go out into the world. <laughs> um, Cause yeah, the mouth, the mouth zip shut. And then the whole, the hood comes over the whole face and the hood zips front uh, shut from the front as well. So it's like a straight up, you know, bondage, get a mask, you know, uh, you know, it came I, from Asia. I got, I got to ask then, have you at any point gone to like Walmart or a grocery store and just done your regular shopping with that thing on? Just like, yep, this is my <laughs> face mask. I have not, but if there were a time that I could do it and get away with it, it would definitely be right now. I feel like that's a great uh, idea for a music video now that I say that out loud. Yeah. Yeah. Well, somebody else could do it because that thing is awful to put on. Like, put it, just putting it on as a, as a goof uh, at home, I couldn't I couldn't rip the thing off fast enough. Yeah, because you can't you can't really see or hear and you can't breathe. Uh, and then you feel like, you know, the, it's tight. And so it's this latex that's just like suffocating your, your 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 face. Your skin can't breathe like it's truly awful to, to put on. I guess if you're wearing that while fucking or getting fucked or something, it does something for certain people. But um <laughs> You know, I, I've got a, I've got one more question for you, and and then I kind of got to get going. Um, sure. What else can fans expect from Skin Show? How do, how does this differ from Future Cult? Well, I don't want to ruin the surprise. Um, Ooh. But uh, no, I would just say to not really, not really go in with any expectations. Um, you know, it's a different record than Future Cult, but uh, the the same. It's made up of the same stuff. The same formula is, is still there, um, but it's you know it's a it's a different record. Uh, we approached it in a different way. Uh, I think I think if anything, you could you could expect a, a bit of a, a meatier record. Uh, it's it's the the songs are are more solid. I think. Uh, um, you know, there, there's more uh, uh, traditional songwriting in a way where Future Cult, a lot of songs are just kind of this like, you know, sort of linear journey where it goes through these different, you know, these different soundscapes. And, you know, we're kind of changing up what the part is like every four or eight measures or whatever. This is this is maybe a little more of a it's traditional. It's 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 closer to it's closer to like a like a rock record. Um, that's why when you said, you know, as a glam rock record in our future, hey, it, it could be because this is a step in that direction. Um, you know, you're still not, you know, you're not going to get any like, ooh, yeah, baby, tonight, tonight lyrics or anything. But um, <laughs> um, the, the idea yeah, of like just, a uh, black metal glam record with like industrial synths and, and new wave beats, that does sound pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I would I would. You know, now you say that, I wish that was a real record that you were telling me like about, because I would immediately check that out. Like the freak child of, like, Motley Crue, Celtic Frost, and Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, that would that would be incredible. I mean, even, you know, one of my one of my favorite black metal bands is Kraft, and I really liked them because the, the first time that somebody heard uh, Let Me Hear Kraft, they were like, dude, it's black metal, but it's like rock and roll. I was like, oh shit, and like hearing it's like, oh shit, I see what you're you're saying. Like, yeah, like, that's it's, actually it's, a great description. 
yeah, it's like it's grim as fuck, and it's definitely black metal. But they like will just jam on a riff, and you could just fucking you could headbang and drink a beer to this black metal, you know? Hell yeah, um, that's my kind of black metal. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I've I've had enough of this yeah, larping in the wood record. shit. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, as far as our record, yeah, just uh, um, I don't know. I I would say go in with an open mind. Because at it, it first, I don't know, maybe it, it maybe it won't quite be what you want from a band like us, or maybe it could be more. I I don't know. It might be it might almost be too uh, accessible for for some people that uh, for some people that like our, our other records, but I don't know. Because again, like you know, as we were talking about Nine Inch Nails and stuff like that, that influences there a lot. You know the songs have choruses this time not all of them but you know there are choruses and hooks and things that you know um certain you know certain gene vests might not like i don't know but uh nothing against gene vests but um yeah i would just say go in with with an open mind um and if you don't like it hey throw on an old record <laughs> buy, buy an extra copy of of one of our old records do that how about that hell yeah I, I gotta say, I'm uh, I was I was pretty pumped for the record, but now I'm more excited. I'm 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 gonna have to bug Season of Mist until they send me a copy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think another um, I don't know when when this will come out, but the next uh, single from the record will come out. I think I want to say it's February thirteenth. Um, and there's another song there, and that's uh, I'm actually really excited about that one. That that song is is really really cool. Um. And there's a, a a video for it as as well that'll be out, and the video is is pretty goddamn strange, uh, and Ooh. and wonderful. Um, so uh, yeah, so keep an eye out for that as well. But that should I, I think the next the next single should shed a little more light on what the album is like as a whole, because not everything's like Neon Teeth. Like Neon Teeth is more or less a fucking pop song, you know. Um, and there 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 is some some. You know, stranger. There's some some more bizarre stuff. Uh, you know, on, on the record, and some some weirder some weirder colors and textures. Uh, and I think this next single that's coming out will kind of, you know, give a little bit of a, a preview of that stuff. Hell yeah! I, I look forward to hearing and seeing all of that. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time, Rick. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, likewise, man. Thanks for having me on. It's 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 I'm 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 up for bullshitting about Judas Priest and then you know talking shit about other bands anytime. Yeah, yeah so. we, we we talked shit about uh, Volbeat, Trapped, Modern Metallica, and Slayer. We ruined a lot of tour opportunities for you for sure. Yeah, we we might have. That's okay. I don't think any of them were calling us anytime soon anyway. <laughs> You know, I, hey, I have no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Twitter right now and apologize if I have to. You know, it's yeah. fine. At Chris Taylor Brown, if you're even on here anymore, sorry we <laughs> called you a bunch of bootlickers. Yeah. Oh, he's the trapped guy, isn't he? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think he might have also gotten booted from Twitter. I, don't, I don't, I don't know. He did, and I, I don't even want to get into why. It's a very stupid and gross reason. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure it's, it's trapped that's all you need to know yeah trapped i say it's, it's trapped. trapped so of course it's stupid and gross that's kind of their it's kind of their bread and butter stupid and gross well he, here's hoping at some point in the future you can get you up to toronto play a show and we can share a drink absolutely man that sounds great you enjoy the rest of your day rick hey you as well cheers brother cheers and ladies and gentlemen, that was Rick from The Lion's Daughter. We got a lot of juicy tidbits out of him. We may have also ruined his chances at being on tour with Trapped and uh, Metallica and many other bands, but he seems cool with it, so why should I fret? If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you check out Lion's Daughter's brand new album, uh, Skin Snow, when it comes out in April. Stay tuned for that new single when it comes out uh soon ish i don't want to say when i recorded this but it it's gonna come around the time that the video fucking thing comes out you get the idea just stay tuned and you have yourself a fantastic fucking day